where, where is it? Where is it? Oh, <laughs> oops. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm assuming you're all the agents, is that correct? Yes? Good, good. Here for the mission. You, you though, you look sus. Does anyone know that, that gentleman? Stand down, stand down. We're here today to learn about this pigeon. And for us to convince you that it is a super pigeon and that we can save it. Now, afterwards, the people from Earlham Institute, which is where I work, have kindly put on the pink pigeon trail in the foyer. And this is a great trail, you get to go around and learn some things about the pink pigeon. But I'm going to be mentioning a lot about the pink pigeon, shockingly. So if you ever see our little friend here on a slide, you're about to find some information that could help you in the trail. So, oh, technology these days. Right. Who's heard of climate change? Yeah? It's not good, is it? It's causing a lot of problems. We're having increased flooding, forest fires, and even droughts. Now, this is not good news for humans, true, but it's also really bad news for animals. You have to put up with all of that and a lot of other problems. So much so that we're going through what some are calling the sixth mass extinction. Now, does anyone know another mass extinction? And a mass extinction is when a lot of animals die off at once. Shout out. The dinosaurs. the dinosaurs. Now, we all know the dinosaurs, but none of us know a dinosaur personally, unfortunately. And in fact, scientists think that in about 40 years, we've lost about 60% of all our animals, from the tiniest insect to the biggest whale. Now, do you think that's a good thing? No, no. good, thank goodness. Whew. Right, but not only are a lot of animals going extinct, they're dying out, a lot of them are just really suffering. They're living in very small groups. And I want you to really understand this. So, join me as we play. Thank you. Now, to this, I need three volunteers to come to the stage, please. Excellent. In the blue jump? I'm done. Brilliant. Oh. oh, I picked one as well, sorry. We've got four. That's all right, four can come up. That's all right, we'll... We've got four or three. Take a hat. I think this is a small one, so it's probably going to take years off her. And a hat. So, while they're getting dressed to impress, I'm going to tell you the aim of the game. It's very simple. No, this is not an animal. Well done. I'm going to say, put a picture of an animal up and say, how many are left? And these four contestants are going to guess. So, if I were to say, how many chairs are in this room? Does anyone want to guess? Go on then. Oh, not quite. There are actually only 500. Nine, it would be great to fit 900 people in here, though. And that's the aim of the game. Right. You all got your boards to write on? There you go. On so, you four need to look at the screen. It helps if everyone else does, too. So, does anyone know what this is? Shout out. A giant panda. Now, you're going to notice in a minute that this funny word comes up. Now, this is the Latin name. I can't pronounce it. I'm not going to try. But the reason we have this is that I speak English. The panda comes from China, and people there will speak Cantonese or Mandarin. So we might have different names for panda, but we have a Latin name so that no matter what language you speak, we all know we're talking about the same animal. And also, as Jeremy said, scientists and academics love long, complicated words. So, right, you lot, how many giant pandas do you think are left? And clue, it's not more than 2,000. So shout out some, give them some help if you want, guys. So just write down a number. 100, 200, 300, 400. You can write down one of these numbers. Have we got a number? Yeah? Have we all got a number? Yeah? All right, brilliant. 
So let's let's see. Everyone turn their boards around. We have 800, 100, 250, 150 to 200. That's a very scientific answer. I like that. <laughs> right. Let's see. Oh, more than 400, more than 800. Oh, there are in fact about 1,800. So who was closest? Fantastic. There's about 1,800 pandas left, which sounds like a lot, but that's only about three times as many people as in this room. So it's not really that many. Right, does anyone know what this weird creature is? Yes, fantastic. You guys are my favorite, axolotl. Now these creatures are amphibians, so they're like our frogs and our newts. How many axolotls do we think are left? Everyone write down a number for me. Okay. The audience are giving you guys some clues if you want. <laughs> Has everyone got a number? Yeah? We all got a number? Okay, brilliant. All right. Now let's have a look how many are left. Oh, there's only a hundred. That's fewer than people in this room left in the whole world. And they're very interesting because they only live in one lake in Mexico City. So let's see, what did you guys say? Oh, 1,400, 1,200, 10,000. See, I wish there were that many axolotls left. Right. This is a parrot, as I'm sure you all know. This is called Spix McCourt. Now, there's a very famous Spix McCourt that is in a film. Does anyone know? Anyone know a... Blue, yes. There you go, from Rio. So, how many Spix's McCourt do we think are left? Yeah, okay. It's okay, yeah? We all got our numbers? Yeah? Oh, we got last minute? Yeah, we're all good? Right, let's have a look. How many do we think are left? Let's have a look at some guesses here. 600, 300 to 500, 500. How many do you reckon? A thousand. Oof. Unfortunately, there are no wild Spix macaws left. They've gone extinct. But, before everyone cries, because that is a very sad thing, a lot of them are in captivity, and this means zoos and things. And zoos are really important for helping to look after animals that need help in the wild. And hopefully, by the end of this year, they'll have taken some individuals from zoos and put them back out into the wild where they can be looked after. So hopefully, next year, that won't be zero. Let's wait and see. Finally, the reason we're all here today, that and poetry, all the peas. How many pink pigeons do you think are left? A thousand. thousand, okay. Five thousand. Zero. I hope not. We good? Have we all got our numbers? Brilliant. How are we doing? Okay. Two. None. Are we all got our numbers, guys? Yeah? Right, let's have a look. How many do you think are left? 800, 200, 2, 0. There are, in fact, 400 pink pigeons left in the wild. So, can we give these guys a huge round of applause for playing? Thank you, guys. You go see Santa's little helper. They've got a little something for you. So, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. So... This is the reason that we're all here today. I'm going to persuade you that this is a super pigeon. And that if we all work hard, we can save this one animal. Now, one animal might not seem a lot when loads are dying, but I want to persuade you that it could hold the key to saving not just itself, but all other animals. So, we're going to learn that pink pigeons are great, that DNA is important, and differences in your DNA are important. Now, don't worry if you don't know what DNA is. By the end of this lecture, I really hope you will. And finally, that Christmas miracles do happen, but we had Father Christmas here earlier. We know they happen. So let me turn on my big fancy spy computer. Ah, hold on, I just need to log in. Brilliant. 
Oh, goodness me. Hold on a minute. Who knew it took so many letters to spell yes? Now, this is the pink pigeon. It's very similar in size and shape to the wood pigeon. And this is the pigeon that you guys probably see in your garden. In fact, they're very similar in behavior. They eat seeds, they eat little leaves. One very important difference, well, two. The pink pigeon is pink. But the other one is, you won't find the pink pigeon in your garden. In fact, the pink pigeon can only be found on an island off the east coast of Africa. In fact, off the east coast of Madagascar called Mauritius. And we say they're endemic. They're only found in one place. Now, I know you're clever, so you've already spotted that this is not a pigeon. But I bet you can all tell me which one is the male, number one or two. Oh, of course, we have our Nala and our Simba. Now, lions are what we call dimorphic. This is, means the males and the females look different. Pink pigeons, on the other hand, oof, are monomorphic. This means they look, the males and females look the same. So scientists have to use their behavior to work out which is the male and which is the female. Now, does anyone guess which one the male is, the one in front or behind? Fantastic. And as you can see, he's sort of walking along like this, raising his neck, settling it down like this. I studied at the Pigeon Dance Academy, thank you. And in fact, we see this behavior in the very pigeons you can go out into our fine city and see. Now, everyone watch this individual here. Oh, yeah, look at him go. He's raising his neck. He's chasing. There we go. I know. This, this is a squab. This is a baby pink pigeon. And I think they are the best things about pink pigeons because they are adorably ugly. Yeah. But unfortunately, pink pigeons aren't very good at being parents. They usually lay about one or two eggs every time, but only one hatches. And often the babies die or the eggs don't hatch. And this is not very good for pink pigeons. Right. So you should now be able to recognize a pink pigeon. So your first mission is I'm going to show you a selection of pictures of pigeons. These are all pigeons, and you need to tell me if it is a pink pigeon or not. Ready? Is this a pink pigeon? No. no. Well done. It's a Nicobar pigeon. What about this one? No. Very good. This is a pink-necked green pigeon. No. What about this one? Yeah. Ah, yes, yeah. I, I understand why you said yes. This is confusion here. This is a pigeon that is pink, but it is not a pink pigeon. <laughs> yeah, I know. What about this one? Ah, yeah. oh, fantastic. We can move on to the next part of your mission briefing. Because to really understand the pink pigeon's peril, we have to go back in time, 400 years to understand how it went from having thousands to only 400 left. You're a, the year is about 1598. You're a sailor. You've been on a ship for months eating nothing but salty biscuits. No fruit, no veg, no chocolate, just salty, maggoty biscuits. And then you hear, and you see a tropical paradise. And this was Mauritius. There were no people on it. 400 years ago. It's not a very big island. It's about half the size of Norfolk. But it's teeming with life. The, fish were f uh, the lagoons were full of fish. There was all this wood on the trees that they could use to fix their boats. And it was full of this endemic, so animals that could only be found on Mauritius. All these weird and wonderful creatures. Here's a pink pigeon. Now, there's a very famous animal that used to live on Mauritius. It appears in Alice in Wonderland stories. Does anyone know what this animal is? Shout it out. Oh, you are good. The dodo. Unfortunately, within about 40 years of humans arriving, the dodo had gone extinct. Because unf unfortunately, um, we'd eaten it. Um, the animals on Mauritius didn't know that humans 
were predators. They didn't know that we wanted to eat them. So they were really friendly. They'd come up and say, hi, and they would go, mm, breakfast. Um, it's not the best kind of friendship. So the dodos went extinct. They got eaten. A lot of the parrots got eaten. Even the giant tortoises, because they were very easy to catch, they're not the fastest creatures, were eaten. The pink pigeons escaped this, not because they're very clever, but for two reasons. First of all, Mauritius was full of forest. It was really hard to get into. And all this happened around the coastline. The second reason is, when sailors tried to eat pink pigeons, they got ill. I mean, really ill. They would see things, they would hallucinate, they'd get a fever, and they'd have a dicky tummy. So they decided not to eat pink pigeons. Unfortunately, it wasn't just humans eating the pink pigeons. With humans came rats. And then we brought cats over because we don't like rats. But the thing is, rats are really hard for cats to chase, so they'll just eat the pigeons. Um, at some point, monkeys, crab-eating macaques, go to Mauritius. They escape from the pet trade. And they'll also eat pink pigeons and their eggs. And then finally, if that wasn't enough, we introduced mongooses to try and, again, eat the rats. Rats are hard to catch, so what did they eat? You got it. And it wasn't just that. Now, humans arrived 400 years ago. But about 300 years ago, if you imagine the green as all the natural trees and plants you'd find in Mauritius, it was still covered. It was really good. Humans had taken a little bit out to make some settlements, make some houses, maybe farm a bit of food. But it was a really hard place to live. It's a tropical island. So although it's beautiful, there are cyclones. It's really hard to grow food. But then they discovered something that grew very well and would make them a lot of money. And this was sugarcane. Now, sugarcane is where we used to get our sugar. Who likes sugar in here? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm a chocoholic. And this is what happened to all the natural trees and plants when humans discovered they could do that. And today, there's less than 5%, very little natural trees and um, plants left. Now, it isn't a barren rock, but a lot of it is now sugar claim plantations, so farms, tea farms, coffee farms, and pigeons can't live on farms. And they also can't eat sugar cane, so it means that the pink pigeons don't have anywhere to live, and they don't have enough to eat. So, recap. 1598, humans arrived. About 40 years, the dodos went extinct. By 1900, all these animals, which were all endemic, so only found on Mauritius, had all gone extinct. And in 1975, the pink pigeon looked set to go the same way. There was fewer than 20 individuals left in one place. It was a wood that they called pigeon wood because that is where the pigeons lived. It was very inventive naming. Then this gentleman happened. Does anyone know who he is? And I will give you a hint. It's not Father Christmas. De Gerald, guys, very good, Gerald Durrell. Now, he's been in this TV show some of you may have seen, and he's also written a lot of books. He saw the pink pigeon, and he said, I want to save this, but there's only 20 left, so we might, we might not do it. So, first of all, he took a, a few of them and put them in his zoo in Jersey, safe and sound in captivity where they'd be looked after, they could have families and live a happy life, but still be alive. And then they set to work on everything that was making the pink pigeon not very healthy. So, first thing, they're not very good at having chicks. So what they would do is they would take an egg from a wild individual and put it under a foster dove. So this is a Barbary dove. As you can see, the baby pink pigeon is already almost bigger than its foster parent. So think of this poor bird having to feed the baby pink pigeon. And then what would happen is the parents would lay another egg, so you'd get two baby pink pigeons raised at the same time. They didn't have enough food, so they'd feed them. Similar grain and stuff to how you might feed your pet chickens. Then disaster struck. The pink pigeons started getting ill, with an illness that is rapidly spreading already over Europe and has really caused a lot of decline in our songbirds. So what do you do when you get ill? You go to the doctor, right? So they gave the pink pigeons medicine to make them better. After all this hard work, the pink pigeons went, actually at their lowest, they went down to 10, whew, and then went back to 350. They went from 
20 individuals in a single subpopulation to today between 350 and 450 individuals across, actually it's, here I've got seven, I think there's two new ones, nine subpopulations. And a lot of this work was done by the Mauritius Wildlife Foundation. So, thank you very much, uh, they're saved, I'm gonna, no, no. Unfortunately, although they were saved from certain extinction from 20 individuals up to 350, 450, that isn't the end of the story. And there's two reasons for this. This is what 400 pink pigeons look like. It's fewer than the number of people currently in this room. Now, I don't know about you, but if this was all that was left of humanity, do you think that's enough? No. Not really. And the second thing was, you saw how much effort they put in to try and save the pink pigeon. And yet, if they stopped any one of those things, the pink pigeons would decline again. They would start dying. It was as if something was stopping the pink pigeons really recovering. And they thought maybe the answer was something we couldn't see. Maybe the answer's in their DNA. <coughs> so, what is DNA? Well, pink pigeons like us are made up of things called cells. We have billions, trillions, a number that is too big to think about. And inside every one of these cells is a nucleus, and inside that nucleus is DNA. It stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a unnecessarily long word, and it's made up of four chemicals, A, T, G, and C, that's what we call them, and that's DNA. But what is it? Well, it's your blueprint of life. It's all the instructions needed to make you, you. It tells you what colour eyes you're going to have, what colour hair you're going to have. It's a bit like, who likes Lego? <laughs> And if anyone like, you know, parents sitting at the front who might know me are thinking about Christmas gifts, this of course is a Hogwarts Lego castle. It's a very complex piece of Lego. So you need instruction booklets, don't you? Right? It's be really hard to build this without an instruction booklet. We're more complicated even than Lego Hogwarts Castle. So we need a book, we need instructions that say put this brick here, put this brick here. And that's what our DNA does. It's exactly like our Lego instruction booklets. And you get half your DNA from one parent and half from the other. And this is why I have red hair, which I get from my mum. I get my dad's eyebrows. Thank you, dad. And I think the nose is, is thanks to both of them. And if you don't believe me, they're sitting in the front here. You can check it out for yourself later. But how does it work? How do you go from this chemical to this? Well, it's very simple. DNA is made up of these four chemicals, A, T, G, and C. The order of these chemicals is what we call your DNA code. And this is what we have to crack to really understand DNA. Let me give you an example. So, these are three letters in a certain order. What do they mean? Thank you, this is Zelda everyone. In the same way that we know that D-O-G means dog, our body knows that wh whatever that, that is up there means, for example, make my eyes blue. So the order of those four chemicals are the words, they're the instructions that our body knows to make your eyes blue, green, to give you different color hair, whatever. This is what it is. All right, well, that's fine. But why is DNA important in conservation? Well, we're going to talk about two things that often occur in animals that need help. So conservation is when an animal needs help, it needs to be saved. And these two things are often problems, inbreeding and low DNA diversity. So inbreeding is when you have related people having babies. And that leads to illnesses which we call inbreeding depression. Bear with me. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to marry any one of my brothers or sisters because they're really annoying. <laughs> but it turns out that there's also loads of bad health problems and illnesses that happen. This is King Charles II of Spain. Now, I'm going to point out to you here his chin. His mum and dad were uncle and niece. That is a, t a form of inbreeding, and unfortunately it left him with a lot of illnesses. He died very young, at the age of only 39. He was ill a lot of his life. And if you can see his big chin here, I'm not being rude, but 
it was so big and his tongue was so big, he couldn't eat properly, he couldn't speak properly. It was really not a good thing. To give you another example, does anyone know who this is in your history lessons? Shout it out. Precisely. Now, his mum and dad were brother and sister, and he married his sister. Now, unfortunately, he was so ill for most of his life, his foot literally died. It just died. He was always in pain. He could barely walk. And when he married his sister and they tried to have babies, all their babies died. So as we can see, inbreeding is not a good thing. So how can DNA help us? Well, first of all, it can help us understand, is there inbreeding? And then it can help us understand who's related to who. Because I've tried, but when you ask a pink pigeon who's your family, they just don't reply. And the third thing is, if we know that they're going to have inbreeding, and if we can find the bad bits of DNA, we know they have them, we can start thinking about treating them, getting them medicines. So for an example, this is Queen Victoria. And Queen Victoria, a lot of her um, descendants, her children, people she was related to, suffered from a disease called haemophilia. And this was because, again, of inbreeding and inbreeding depression. Now, haemophilia means if you cut yourself, you keep bleeding, which is, is not a good thing. For one thing, you use up a lot of plasters. For another, actually, a lot of her descendants died from this, which is not nice at all. But today, we can treat this, as, we can treat this with medicines. So if we know they're going to have an illness, we can make sure we have the medicines to treat them and they, people and animals can survive. So the second thing was low DNA diversity. And this is when it's talking about differences in everyone's DNA. So why are differences in everybody, in every bird's DNA important? Well, we're all good at different things, right? Who's here is good at drawing? Put your hands up. Who is good at sport? Yeah? Singing? Science? <laughs> it's good to be good at different things. I'm good at science, I'm really bad at maths, but that means if I ever need help with maths, I would ask my little brother who would help me with my maths. And it's good, we help each other, don't we? And it's the same with your DNA. It's the same reason we have different jobs. We have doctors, we have policemen, we have firefighters. You don't always need a firefighter because your house isn't always on fire. But when your house is on fire, you really need a firefighter, right? So it's good to have differences. Let me give you an example. We have two groups. The first group has differences in their DNA. So you can't tell it just by looking at them, but if we crack their DNA code, we know which has differences and which don't have differences. And all the yellow birds get sick every time there's a blue moon. And all the blue birds don't get sick. Now, we don't often have blue moons. So most of the time it doesn't make a difference. But what happens if we have a blue moon? Well, all the ones who get sick will die. But it's okay, we had diversity. So all the blue ones will survive and we'll have a nice healthy population. Fantastic. But if we had a group with no DNA diversity, most of the time it might be okay because there's not a blue moon. What happens if there's a blue moon? They die. And that's game over, unfortunately. And unfortunately, animals like the pink pigeons, who there aren't very many left, live in small groups, tend to have low DNA diversity. So, pink pigeons get eaten by things, they don't have places to live, they don't have enough food, they get ill. Now we know they get inbreeding and they have low DNA diversity. So I know what you're all thinking, agents, I know, okay? <sighs> Why bother? Well, because we can actually do something about all their DNA problems. But in order to do this, we have to crack their DNA code. Now, how do we do this, do people think? We use science. <laughs> so, so, Santa's little help is going to come up, and I need two volunteers to come and help us do some science. You pick one, I'll pick one. Righto. Let's have, there's a, a young lady in a tutu and a red top, yes? On the edge here, yeah, come down. Fantastic. 
So, while Santa's little helper is getting you ready, I'm going to explain what we're doing in this first part. The first part of cracking the code is actually getting the DNA. Because DNA, as we found out, is in cells. Now, we're not getting DNA from pink pigeons or humans. There's a lot of forms involved in that. But we're going to get DNA from raspberries. So, just like us, raspberries are made up of loads and loads of cells. Now, you might notice that this cell looks different to the one I showed you earlier. Well, are we different to plants? Are animals different to plants? <laughs> Most people said yes. So, it makes sense we have different cells. But, just like us, the plant's DNA is in the nucleus. So, what this means is, we have to get the DNA out of first the nucleus, then the plant cell. And the way we do this is called extraction. So, we have prepared for you instructions. So what we're about to do now, you can do at home with parents' help. And all those instructions can be found round, dotted around here. You'll notice a few animal stickers. If you go with your parents or your own phone and you can use the QR code, you'll have access to a lot of our briefing material, a lot of our mission documents, including how to do this. So the first thing we do is we have our raspberries in a Ziploc bag. And what we're going to do is add washing up liquid and salt. Now, here we're using some I prepared earlier in the style of Blue Peter. We pour all that in. And then the fun part comes. Fantastic. So what we're doing here is in a minute, what they're going to start doing for me is once Santa will help us make sure the bag is sealed, squishing them. We're going to really, 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 really squish the raspberries. I want them blitzed, nothing left. What we're doing here is both physically and chemically breaking open the cells. We're breaking open the raspberries, breaking open the cells, and what that means is it gives everything inside the cell the, cell, the chance to come out. Then when the nucleus is, is in the chemicals, Everything inside the nucleus can come out. Right. How are we doing there? Oh, that looks marvelously squished. Squished, by the way, is a scientific term. <laughs> Fantastic. There we go. Right, so we have in this bag, can you hold it up? Thank you. A lot of squished raspberries. So now what we have to do is separate the DNA from everything else. That's it. Easy. So first of all, we separate the big bits from the small bits using a very high-tech piece of equipment called a sieve. And what I want you to do for me, guys, is use the spoon and gently push it through the sieve to get as much liquid out as possible. Brilliant. So then what we should have in the bottom here is we've taken the big bits of the raspberry out. We should be left with our DNA and everything else that was in the cell there's a whole bunch of stuff the cell needs that we don't have to worry about. Look at that, that's doing great. Um, so then what we need to do is separate the DNA from everything else, okay? To do this, we use alcohol. So Santa's little helper is going to be doing this part. And if you want to do this at home, you can use rubbing alcohol, things you can get from Boots in the Pharmacy, or I'm sure your parents may have access to some other potential alcohol. Thank you. It should be under there. Brilliant. So this works best if your alcohol is cold. So we have a nice box under there, and I'm hoping that Sansa's helper doesn't get freeze burns. It is very cold. It is very cold. And it's a child safety lock. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Nope. She's very strong. Oh, God. Right. So we're using 80 milliliters, more or less. So, yeah. And then what Science Help is going to do is pour it very, very, very gently. So it doesn't mix, but just sort of sits on top. It takes a while, but slow and steady and all that. Can you see the stuff appearing on the top? White stuff or pale pink? 
So what they're seeing even now is this. This chemically separates the DNA from everything else in the cell. And there we have it. We have DNA on top there. Can you guys see it all white? Can you see the white bits? Yeah. Yeah? And everything white in there is DNA. So that's it. We've done it. And we'll leave it up here later if people want to come and have a look. Um, or can we, can we pull it very gently and let the nice cameraman see it? Yeah. Take it over to us. So it will get more and more over time, but you can just see at the minute, everything pale pink and everything um, white. You on top? Well, that's right. We'll put it under the AV visualizer later and you can come and see. But we're getting quite a good amount in here. So thank you very much. A huge round of applause to our volunteers. And that's it. You can do that at home under adult supervision. Time to go spying again, guys. So that's our DNA. But I don't know what that means. That looks at the minute like some white goo. Uh, and that means nothing to me. So we now need to go ahead and crack the DNA code. Now that we've got the DNA, let's crack the code. In the olden days, this is called the Enigma machine. This was used in World War II to crack codes, and it literally took the space of a room. We have our own machines called sequencers that we use to crack the DNA code. So we take DNA. If we're doing it from an animal, we take a blood sample. If you've been to the doctor, you get a little, little blood sample. It doesn't hurt them. We put this through this machine. This is our code breaker, the sequencer. There you go. It cracks the code. So it looks a bit like this, right? We have our machine. We turn it on. and it cracks the code for us. So this is what it would look like. And as you can see here, it cracks the code and even shows us the differences. So that one parent had a different DNA from another one, which as we know is good. So once we have this information, we can use it. Once we've cracked the code, we can use this to do something called genetic rescue. Now this sounds really complicated. It sounds like you're gonna be making a Frankenstein monster and, and putting bits of cat with bits of pigeon. You're not, nothing like that. All it means is if you have a population or a group of animals, a group of birds, which have differences in their DNA, which we know is good, and one group that doesn't have differences, you just take some from this one, move them over. Now, does that side now have more colors? Yeah, more differences in its DNA? Perfect. I know. It's very cute, but this animal almost died out. There were fewer than 30 left, and they were declining. They had loads of health problems, they had king tails, heart problems, and then they used this genetic rescue. They took eight individuals from Texas who had different DNA, introduced them, and this was 40 years ago. The species called Florida panther is still alive today and increasing, and most of their illnesses went away just through this method. And we can do this with the pink pigeon because do you remember where did Gerald Durrell put some pigeons? In his zoo. In his zoo. You have got good memories. You're all going to make excellent spies. And researchers at Kent, so scientists at the University of Kent, have shown that they have differences in their DNA. They've cracked the code. So all we need to do is take some from Jersey Zoo, put them over there. Now, to make sure this worked, we used a very fancy computer, even fancier than my spy computer. We put in all the information we could about the pink pigeon to see would it work. It would work! The pink pigeon is saved! Thank you. Thank you. So, this is what we've now started to do. But maybe I haven't convinced you guys why we should save the pink pigeon. Now, you're all clever people. Sorry, most of you look like clever people. And I, th I think we can all agree that it's important to save animals. Yes? Thank you. But the pink pigeon is very special. Because when an animal gets rare, it gets hard to find. This means it's really hard for scientists to study. 
But we have so much information on the pink pigeon, and we have its DNA. And that's, again, very hard to get from animals. Can you imagine trying to get a blood sample from a tiger? Would you want to approach a tiger with a needle? No. And the whole point is, we can use this to make a pink pigeon protection plan that we can use then for other animals that we don't have the time to go out and get all this information from. So it really could help save a lot more animals. Now, we've covered some hard topics today. And some of them have had sad endings. But I want to leave you with a few Christmas miracles to show what hard work and conservation can do. So, this is the black-footed ferret. In 1986, there were only 18. In fact, at one point, they were thought to be extinct. Then a dog walker found some. Just another reason why dogs are great. Now, in 2019, there are 400 of them. Here, we have the whooping crane, which went down to only 20 individuals in 1941. Today, there are 700 whooping cranes alive. This fantastic creature is the blue iguana. In 2000, there were only 25 left. In just 16 years, in 2016, does anyone want to guess how many there were? More than 800? 1,000, yes. And finally, this is Shavalsky's horse. And they went extinct in the wild, but there were some left in the zoo. So through a lot of hard work, through cracking the DNA code, through putting all of this information together, today there are 1,900. Right? <laughs> so. I should add, I had nothing to do with any of that, <laughs> but thank you. And it's, these are just some examples. There's even more. And again, if you go round on the walls here, you'll see pictures of animals with QR codes. This is going to give you some more information on some of the animals that we've talked about today. But it takes a huge effort to save animals. And here I just want to thank all the people who've helped me today, and also to give you an idea of all the people who have helped to save the pink pigeon. And if you want to go see some, these are the zoos in the UK and Ireland that you can go and see them in. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I want to save all the animals right now. Good. So what can you do? Well, at home, make your home wildlife friendly. It's not just animals in exotic places that need help. It's animals everywhere, and especially, actually, in England and the UK generally. So. Who recycles? Give me a shout. Yes. Fantastic. That's what we like to hear. You can create insect hotels, because insects are really important. A lot of things eat them, and they help make our food. Make your garden hedgehog friendly. Make your garden bird friendly. Make some bird feeders. There's some great things you can do at home. And if you want to help even more outside of your home, there's loads of places you can volunteer, or you can go and visit and donate a bit of money. So for example, if you go to Bannum Zoo, they give money to help research and they help conservation. So just by going to the zoo, which is fun, I think we can all agree, you can help conservation. You can help at Norwich Science Festival. You can visit some of our many RSPB reserves. And maybe at school, if you're asked to do a school project, you could pick an endangered animal, an animal that needs some help, and you can tell your class about it. Because what really matters, guys, is everyone in this room cares and we want to make a difference, and we can, because you can't save the world alone. So Merry Christmas, and thank you so much for coming to hear me today. And remember, after this, you can all go and do the Pink Pigeon Trail. So thank you.